Let's sing that song, Only a God. Let's sing unchanging.
churches throughout our nation, uh, especially the Prescott congregation. want to also pray for the Cape as they get ready for Bible conference uh, just a short time away. want to pray for the works we co-labor with in the Northeast, uh, the hand of God that would be up on Massachusetts, New York, PA. We want to remember the works in Jersey. want to pray for our pioneer works, especially that God's hand would be upon these and that uh, they would be established and they would be strengthened. Uh, pray for the Edwards. As they contend, that is our baby church that we have launched out, God's hand upon this. Souls that have responded recently with the labors, uh, the uh, evangelizing, street preaching, different things that men have been doing and events that we've had that God would touch and draw these lives and these hearts. Uh, those that have been launched out of the Cape, uh, some are down in Florida, some are in uh, uh, co-laboring in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, the Connors. We also want to pray for our overseas works. God's hand uniquely upon these. Uh, uh, Israel, we want to pray for. My wife gets uh, reports back from uh, some of our churches that are there. They're doing very, very well. Uh, 
Uh, God's accelerating the gospel, uh, pioneer works that are going out. We want to lift up some you might know uniquely by name, some we've co-labored with. Uh, put these before the throne. Pray for the backslider to be healed, uh, those that have uh, drifted from Jesus, and those that have recently called upon the name of Jesus to be helped. Uh, and then uh, we want to ask God to move by the Holy Ghost this morning and speak to lives. Pray for our nation and uh, blessing upon our country. Uh, as we subside this morning in prayer, Brother Vic, if you could lift your voice. Let's believe God. Let's contend. Uh, ask God to minister this morning in our service. Father, we ask you to be a strong presence in this place. This morning, your spirit to minister to those online, those in the ear. <laughs> That there would be an excellence, God, that touches hearts, touches lives. Lord, that would bring conviction, that would bring hope, that would bring encouragement, that would challenge if any are in sin, God, they would repent. If any don't know you, God, that they would come to a place of saving grace. Responsiveness and transformation, the power of your spirit be poured out, God, upon this region of the Northeast, that you would bless and minister and use these tiny words, God, to reach the lost, that you would use the, these lives, God, that you'd be impacted, that you bring deliverance and change. Father, we are grateful to be a part of what you're doing to this earth, God. We continually pray for a dimension of your favor, a dimension of fruitfulness, a dimension of your grace. And that it be a blessing before you and your throne this morning. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Father, we give you the praise this morning. Father, thank you. Lord, the truth for all of your prayer, for your people, the inspiration that you give God, and the direction you bring to lives. You can be seated this morning. I'd like to welcome everyone out to our uh, Sunday morning service. And uh, just, uh, we have uh, just a few announcements. I uh, want to remember uh, the. Let me get this. I apologize. Thank you. I uh, want to remember our regular schedule of services, uh, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, 11 and 7. We also have adult Sunday school, 10 a.m., uh, and that is Memorial Stones. Uh, and uh, this is a series done by our senior pastor, Pastor Greg Mitchell. 4 p.m. is Portuguese ministry, and then we have midweek service. This is 7 p.m. Prayer is an hour before both of our evening services, and so take note of that. Uh, we, we have uh, outreach on Saturdays, and uh, just prior to this is prayer at 2 o'clock, outreach at 3 throughout the week. Monday through Friday, we also have prayer 6 to 8 in the morning time. encourage you uh, to be a part of that. Uh, coming up April 13th, we are going to be sending an impact team to Bridgeport. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet for that. We're helping out the Catalas. Uh, they are always supporting us. Uh, events that we have and they're going to be having revival with evangelist Craig McLaughlin. I uh, did get an update of that. Their revival is going to be the 25th through the 27th. Uh, we did an overlap uh, and uh, that is uh, uh, we're helping them a little bit early and so this is uh, their revival is going to be a little bit later in the month so you can take note uh, 25th and 27th. Then uh, April 15th through the 19th, that is Monday through Friday, Northeast Bible Conference with the main speakers being Pastor Greg Mitchell, Pastor Jeff Day. We're going to be fasting for this, uh, uh, getting a hold of God. The building will be open here uh, the 8th and the 9th. We're going to fast Monday, third, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and this is 6 to 8 on Monday and Tuesday. We'll have regular service on Wednesday, and so join us for that. We'll get a hold of God. We'll believe God for great things uh, here personally at our local assembly in the Northeast, uh, also for the Cape, that there'd be a blessing upon that. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet. Uh, I know we're, uh, most of the people are going to be going to Bible conference, and so that's exciting. Uh, we, are, uh, we are having to uh, create a special arrangement for Wednesday, and so continue to pray for that. Uh, then coming up, May, uh, actually before that, uh, two events, told you about the revival in Bridgeport, uh, just making you also aware Pastor Foley is going to be doing revival in Malden, and so uh, 
this is going to be the 29th and the 30th will be the dates. That's a one, Monday and a Tuesday that's open to you. So take note of that if you're interested in going to hear uh, the preaching. Then May 11th, we're sending an impact team to Manchester, Connecticut. And Bridgeport's going to be joining us there as well, supporting. But this is going to be for the Edwards, helping them uh, as they're continuing to pioneer break ground. Here locally, May 19th, we are going to be having Pastor Campbell in both the Sunday morning and Sunday evening service. Uh, that is our senior pastor leadership in the Northeast here. And so uh, looking forward to being able to have him. And then it's kind of like you have feast or famine. That coming Wednesday, we are going to be having Pastor Jesse Morales. And so uh, it's going to be, it'll be a fun week. And uh, so we're looking forward to this. And so... Uh, that is all on those. One of the things that uh, uh, an opportunity came up, uh, received, a, received an email. Uh, many of you have watched The Chosen over, uh, over different seasons, and they do probably one of the best presentations I've ever seen and make you think about what it might have been like in Jesus' time. Present Jesus very, very well. Uh, it is not a replacement for the Bible. They're not, you know, everything. It's like, where is that in the Bible? It's like they're building a story around the Bible, and they do a very good job. But uh, one of the things, they've had it in the theaters recently, but they made it available to churches. And so what I'm going to do is uh, Monday and Tuesday after the fast, which might be a little too late for some people, but... Uh, fast ends, uh, uh, praying here at the building, we're going to pray from 6 to 8, and uh, on Monday, 6 to 8 on Tuesday, at 8 o'clock, I'm going to show uh, what we have is uh, season 4, episode 1, 2, 3, and 4, and so I'm going to show uh, episode 1, Tuesday I'll show episode 2, uh, nothing on Wednesday, we will have normal church service, Thursday at 7 o'clock, I will show uh, episode 3, and then Friday I'll show episode 4. If you want to come, be a part. If you want to invite somebody that doesn't know Jesus, uh, that would be a great uh, something, just a, another outreach opportunity to be able to invite him here. Uh, a good show. Uh, I've had a chance to preview what it is. Uh, all of them have the ability to bring a good gospel message from, but uh, that would be the hope. You could bring somebody possibly, but uh, nonetheless, we're going to be showing that. And so you can take note. You can be a part. Uh, you don't have to support this. It's going to be shown anyways, uh, uh, but uh, doing this uh, for the benefit of the congregation, the season is then put off for different reasons right now, but they have made it available to the church, so uh, you take note. That is all for announcements. We're going to give to the Lord this morning his tithe. Uh, we can have our rushers come this morning. Second Corinthians 4 talks about the fact we have this treasure. This is uh, Paul speaking about the gospel what he preached, what he, uh, what he declared. He said, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power of God uh, may be of God and not of us. In other words, you don't have it all in you. It's nobody does, but God's able to move through us as we surrender to God. But Paul talked about events that took place, what it was like for them as they served God and said, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed. But not in despair, we are persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. And Paul is dealing with life in the extreme, but uh, it, it reveals struggles and difficulties really are a part of life. And it's a good picture of us finding ourselves, uh, if you will, not in our favorite kind of situations, but the difficulties that face us all. And Paul brings out this point. He says, hard-pressed, perplexed, troubles, uh, and yet in this time, we experience God's grace. It's not that life is without difficulties. It's full of difficulties. And salvation is not the erasure of difficulties. It just we eliminate the troubles of sin that we can bring upon ourselves. Uh, and he said we're not crushed. We're not in despair. We're not forsaken. And it talks about the grace that's in the middle of serving God. Maybe you find yourself... Uh, in some of these situations, and you can relate. Uh, maybe it's uh, home troubles, health troubles, difficulties, uh, and it's a picture of outcome of faithfulness when he says how they've come through. We're not forsaken. That means we pressed through. We didn't stop when it was difficult. It's a picture of faithfulness, which is what we're called to. Some at this point get offended, disillusioned. Some stop being faithful. 
and falter when times are tough. But if you read a little further on, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16, it says, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, that's how he viewed troubles, our light affliction is for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. God's working something exceeding great uh, and glorious as we continue to give as we continue to remain faithful this is just one facet of serving God of being faithful to the one who saved us uh, his tithe uh, and our offerings uh, and what we give to the things of the kingdom we continue to give remain faithful we continue to be liberal we continue to invest in the kingdom the Lord bless the gift and giver this morning uh, brother Vic go ahead and pray over this Father, again, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity that we have, have this morning to give. I pray the obedience of your saints be rewarded with favor and a dimension of God's blessing that nobody else will be able to provide. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the name. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Testimonies this morning. Uh, one from uh, uh, Brother Vic. Uh, we had a story slam uh, on Tuesday, and then Brother Shane did give a quick testimony. Just want to, would like to give the testimony of Thursday's uh, events. Thursday, uh, uh, I had a conversation with the folks that were going to give the stories. Uh, as a known fact, being a public speaker is one of the most um, scary things that people can do, kind of on the top of the list. And uh, every single story, um, and some people were not as nervous as others, and others broke through their nervousness and were able to actually give out and be able to portray a story that was very personal for them. Every single person here from the church that was able to speak and able to communicate to their best ability the story that was given um, uh, that they were trying to portray at that point. They did an excellent job. I just want to commend you. Uh, the fact that everybody participated as a whole to come together to reach a community that was the initial goal. That was, I'd like to commend every single one of you that were part of it here this uh, morning. Um, but above all, what we saw, we saw that we, we, we rub shoulders on a consistent basis, uh, individual to individual, some of you a little bit longer in longevity than others, and you, you don't uh, get to uh, hear some of these uh, per, uh, stories that are pertinent parts of people's lives that actually bring, in my opinion, by listening to some of them, which I didn't know, um, it brings, uh, as Pastor mentioned this morning, uh, these are people that have gone through certain circumstances and through the fire and through life's ups and downs and within that scope they remain faithful and they're here. They haven't been scandalized. They haven't left. They haven't just turned around and blamed God. They're here. And so for that regard, I think it was, it was a blessing to everyone that was there. I know that people that are newer converts, they really enjoyed it. They commented on how excited it was. And so... Um, Pastor Javier, I invited you to come so we can get, a, get an idea. The goal is for this to be used as a tool of evangelism that will be impacting lives and will be also a dynamic for people to be in, uh, participating in, in not just a spectator type of environment, 
And so I believe he has one for the end of this month. And uh, I'm definitely planning on going, and I pastor most likely will announce that as it comes close to that day. Uh, and so as we progress to have these, uh, for perhaps a different setting, a different day, a different day, I think that God is going to give us favor. It's going to give opportunity for people to participate and, uh, and uh, maybe even perfect some of the things that uh, I might not have done as well as it could have been done. And so I really believe that God can use us as we go forward and that God can actually begin to redeem the lives as we really pursue Him in this Praise God. fashion. Praise God. So uh, uh, Wednesday, I asked the church to pray for a for employment uh, for me. Um, I'd asked the church two years ago to, or a couple years ago to pray for employment. Uh, so uh, it seems that the time is cutting down as how, as how long it takes for answer. The last time it was two weeks. This time it was three days. Friday interview, job offer, same day. I start in two weeks. Thank you guys for praying, and uh, prayer really works. So that's that's the testimony. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, one thing that I can say about the uh, the story slam is some of the stories uh, were not just fascinating in the sense of, you know, you're hearing something unique, but uh, very much a vulnerability with one another that is, uh, that speaks well of a congregation. That's a setting that people can come into when the saints are vulnerable with one another and able to bring forth qualities that are very personal. Uh, that's, uh, that speaks well. It's, it's not just shallow, it's like, here's who I am. And you're around a group of people that love you, care about you, we know each other's faults, we know strengths, and it's like, yeah, we love you, and uh, wanna see everything that God has. And so I was, uh, I was personally blessed by that, and, uh, and again, tremendous stories that came forward, and so, uh, praise God. Turn in your Bibles uh, this morning to John, 14, John 14. Glory to God. Get situated here. A man by the name of Charles Ferguson Ball made the comment, and he was talking about something that we don't have very much reference points for, but as far as a launch, he, said, he spoke of heaven. He said, heaven is a place just as much of a place as New York or Chicago or any other city or Chicopee. And heaven has realities that you are going to step into someday. Heaven has realities that God doesn't just want us pushing aside, but he wants us to be well aware and uh, there was a, a, a survey that was done recently and something that's almost universally true is that everyone wants to know about heaven and everyone also that has any inkling of it wants to go there. A recent poll suggested that nearly 70% of all Americans believe that there is a place called heaven, which is good considering the culture we live in and there is still that degree of belief that there is a place. Uh, there's still something alive in the human heart. Statistics are encouraging because in this age of skepticism, there's something that is still there, something alive. When you ponder the Bible, the Word of God, we get, our, we, we get it revealed to us. We can have all the inklings we want. We can have near-death experiences, many that don't even line up biblically that you can't point to and say, uh, this is going to help you live for God. Just seeing the light uh, is not the same thing as salvation. Uh, you can step into the presence of Jesus or see something or say you saw something. I walked through heaven, but that's not the determining factor. But it is a place that we do want to know about. Jesus himself said very little about it. Uh, there's uh, roughly 19 times he made reference to it. And uh, he spoke about eternal life 
and entering heaven more than he did about the place of heaven. He did make direct reference to heaven when he comforted his disciples in the verse we're going to read, which is John 14. And Jesus intends heaven to be an encouragement. When you look around and you see things, uh, doesn't mean you don't do what you can, you don't pray. But when you look at events, uh, it's not the final stop. It's not the end. I love America, but it's not the final place. It's not at the end all. I have been to places that have been incredibly beautiful. I've been to places that have been uh, miserable experiences in my life. And the all in all, it's not the end. But in John 14, starting at verse 1, Jesus speaking comfort. He said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. You ever been troubled? You ever had difficulty, pressure, problems? Uh, he said, don't be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house uh, are many mansions. Here he is pointing to a place that is not in this world uh, in, a, in, a, in a finality. He said, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to that place to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. In uh, another translation, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Let's consider going to heaven. And what is that? What is that? What, uh, what is it like? And where is heaven? Where is heaven? Is it that it's way, way, you know, we got Hubble and we got uh, the Webb telescope. And is it way, way out past all of these? Uh, because uh, this, is, this is how our heads think. This is how we perceive it. We grasp things in the natural. We grasp things uh, according to what makes sense to us. But there's more. There's three things that we can uh, see as an answer to this. Uh, most important is the fact Heaven is a real place. We have the words in John 14, 1 through 3, that's speaking about that. He speaks about a place where God the Father is. He speaks about a place on building rooms there. Mansions is another way the King James and New King James speaks of. It's a little bigger than a room, a mansion that God is building. He's building something that is legit, something framed out, uh, making this for you a place uh, that he's speaking of, and he's talking about a place where that's being built. It's not just floating out there, but there is something solid to it. There is something real to this place, and he's saying, that's the place I'm going. I'm going to bring you there one day. And uh, twice in three verses, Jesus speaks of heaven as a place, which he speaks about my father's house, uh, and uh, that would be something that would uh, also be a place that you would call home, a real place filled with people would be the description of heaven, which is why the Bible compares heaven to a mansion with many rooms. And sometimes, like an enormous packed city that uh, is filled with people, this is uh, one description. The Bible also tells us heaven is a dwelling place of God. We know his throne is there. We know the throne of God is in that place, and it's not just his throne and nothing else. It's not just his throne and the multitude of angels and nothing else. It is a place. Uh, when you think of a kingdom, the throne doesn't take up the entire kingdom. David sat on a throne. Solomon sat on a throne, an incredible throne of the which there was no like of any other king. And yet that was one particular place. And then the people milled about and places they lived and homes and different areas that were about it. This is the place that God is fashioning for you. The place that God wants you to be encouraged about. The place that God wants that you would even think about uh, and understand. That's where you're going. Angels are there. Beings that uh, they're not the little cherubs. They're not lightweight. I think of uh, if God's intense like the Bible talks about, the angels, uh, you know, he talks about the angel that pulled its sword uh, and the angel that's got their sword raised. Uh, they're, they're built for warfare. They're built strong. One that take, took out 180,000 by himself and probably wasn't even struggling in that, but angels uh, that are there round about. Angels, uh, you know, God talks about and, and alludes to the fact uh, of uh, angels that are about us, servants, uh, 
I wonder how many times uh, that they've uh, done things in our life, in our church, helped events, turned events, you know, demonic spirits. We're always worried about them, but do you think about God's uh, angels that it's like, no, we're holding stuff back. Why are you fretting these things? And so this is, uh, this is a supernatural dynamic that God's put in place. But they'll be there. The one that you bowed your knee to however many years ago or weeks ago or months ago, or decades ago, Jesus Christ is going to be there. That is a place that he is right now and that he's going to be. That's a place that you're going. It's, you're not just going to pray to somebody and be frustrated at times or pray and be blessed like we prayed for Shane and then there's a quick answer. Sometimes we pray for things that takes years. And we're wondering, did God hear? But you're not going to have to wonder, is God here? You're going to be able to see God for yourself. Jesus Christ. Philippians 3.20 talks about our citizenship is in heaven. That is a place. When the way that you and I live right now, you are preparing for that place. Why do we do what we do? Because you're going to a place. Why do we make hard decisions? Because you're being prepared for a place. Do you understand? That this is an imperfect illustration, uh, but the oxygen there is different. Faith uh, is a form of oxygen. The way we live for God, prayer, part of how we navigate it, it's breathing a different air, if you will. The prayers you pray, the life you live is preparing you for a place that's an entirely different atmosphere. These are the things that God does in our life. Third, and kind of fascinating, is in the Bible hints that heaven is not as far away as we might think. Because heaven is a real place. We think of it in natural terms. It's on the other side of the universe. It's way out there. It's somewhere distant. Uh, and uh, another universe, maybe it must be billions and billions of light years away because I can't see it. We tend to think in the natural Heaven may be on the farthest galaxy. And early Christians understood something different, that they would pass immediately from this life into the presence of Christ in heaven immediately. To be absent from the body is to be present with God instantaneously. That's not speaking of something that is galaxies away. And so we think in our natural mind, well, we'll travel faster than the speed of light. How about if the fact that it's not as far in it's absolutely a different dimension. Think about, uh, think about uh, in the sense of another dimension or reality, Enoch walked with God in Genesis 5 and didn't have to go very far to be in God's presence. And then it says, and then one day he disappeared because God took him. He was not, just suddenly gone. And he, it's like he walked out of this dimension into the eternal to be with God. It wasn't distance like we think. It wasn't, it wasn't as far as we tend to think. Man, how far do you have to go? How long did it take him to get through all the galaxies? It's closer than we think. You have Elijah that was taken up, and he was taken up in the chariot of fire into heaven, but he didn't have to fly past Jupiter and around Saturn <laughs> and look out for this and past the stars, and it's, it was gone. He was simply taken into God's presence by way of a holy whirlwind. Similar with Jesus, when he ascended into heaven after the resurrection, he didn't shoot like some rocket, as one man said, past the moon and way up there. He said he was received into the clouds and then gone. From one dimension into another, he simply disappeared from presence. It's not a matter of distance, it's a matter of dimension. You're not as far as you think from heaven. There's a life to be lived. There's a way to live. But to understand that there is something close. There is something that is close to you. God's presence. We think he's far away. As much as I know it, my natural brain always reverts to God's far. As much as I know he's close, I'll never leave you or forsake you. My natural brain refuses to stop making it a distant thing. When I'm praying and I don't feel God. Instantly, my whole internal being is like, hey, it's far away, it's not really, probably not listening. That's what I feel. It's a lie. It's not true. But that's the feeling that you fight sometimes, and you have to push it aside. No, God's not a liar. We have the Word of God that declares who He is. And we think of dimensions, and suddenly it's like, okay, God, you can be right here. I don't have to see you. I don't have to feel you. If you turned off the lights, 
you wouldn't be feeling me up here. You know, all the lights go out, everything goes dark. Obviously, it's daytime, but everything goes dark. You wouldn't feel, oh, I can feel pastor up there. I just feel it. I could walk away, go in the other room. I could drive, leave, drive away if I don't make noise. You wouldn't know if I was here or not. And sometimes uh, we see that way. We're not far from angels. We're not far from God. We're not far from Jesus himself who's praying for you continually. Those prayers are instant. Those prayers, Jesus contends for you continually, knows what you need, knows where you are, knows how to walk things through with you, knows how to be with you in trouble, but also understanding there is a place he's preparing Hebrews 11.37 says, Therefore also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, uh, and there's many different feelings as to what this said, are all the saints looking around? Uh, I've sometimes viewed it that way. But whatever it is, a cloud of witnesses, uh, is this the angels that are around us? Is this God around us? It, how, it doesn't really matter. But that's speaking of something where the dimension is not obscured. It's not way out. It's not uh, somebody beyond the heavens, uh, far away on the other side of galaxies that's got these incredible telescopes watching. It's talking about a cloud of witnesses around us, which speaks of something that is not as far as what we perceive. You're close. What did Jesus say oftentimes? You're close to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has come upon you. It's like it's talking about, it's like it's here. You establish a dynamic of that. But this is talking about a place, not just something, uh, dominions here and authorities here. It's talking about a place that you're going. A place better than where you live now. A place that's better than maybe the home you'd like to have or the situation. I want certain furniture or certain things. It's better than all of that where God is taking us. Heaven's a real place. Jesus is there right now, probably hammering away for you. <laughs> putting siding up, putting gold to trim up. Marble here, not nah, better than marble. Who knows what's being put in place? But who cares about that? Actually, it's going to be a beautiful place, but you get to be with Jesus. You get to be with one another. We've heard all the story slam. We've heard a lot of struggles that we've had, a lot of different situations. Some were life-threatening. Some were life-altering, which was kind of the course of what was the theme of that. We're going to a place where that's not the way it is, a place. And one another, with one another where we're not going to have our flaws and our faults, where God makes us without spot or blemish, where he perfects, not making us everything we want to be. I want to be a superstar he knows what we're supposed to be. He knows how we're supposed to be. That's what he's making us, and that's what he's fashioning. I want to consider a little bit more of what we know about heaven. Secondly, the question often comes from those who are beginning their walk or those who are rekindling their love, that it begins to take an interest. So the midst, sometimes in the middle years, like heaven, yeah, 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 I got life, and I got work, and I got these things, I know I'm going to heaven. But we begin to look a little bit more Either early on, there's a real interest because, man, it's a brand new place. Just got the brochure. This is where I'm going. This is incredible. And later on, when you've been through some things and you're like, you know what? I'm really looking forward to heaven. I am looking forward to this place. Love you all, but I'm looking forward to being with Jesus and seeing you up there. The Bible doesn't give a great deal of information. We can read in certain places where there's vision, there's the throne room, there's the emerald behind the throne, there's brilliant blazing light, there's lightnings, there's thunderings, there's pillars that are shaking. Picture, you know, we just had a little rumble from 4.8 that took place in New Jersey. Sitting there, what's that? What's happening? Maybe they're working downstairs. <laughs> He's talking about the entire place shaking violently and not collapsing, which is amazing to me, but heaven being that place, but some of the things being God's dwelling place. You know, you got the brochure, have you read it? God's dwelling place, that's what heaven is. That's where he lives, that's his place. You guys have come, some of you have been over to the place we're at in Westfield, and it's like, we go over, hey, you wanna come over to my place? This is God's place. Deuteronomy 26 speaks of it as your holy dwelling place, like no other, far beyond what we have, far beyond the best places that we could create and fashion. That's God's holy place in heaven. Isaiah 57, 15, 
He, God said, I live in a high and holy place. And that's not just religious. That's untouched, unblemished in any way by anything that is wicked, bent, uh, crooked. Everything about it is jaw-dropping. 1 Kings 8.43 says, Then listen or hear from heaven where you live and grant uh, what they ask of you. This is the place that's close to you when you're praying. And he's saying, listen from heaven. You know, God can hear you. If it was on the other side of the gap, man, he's got really good hearing. How does he do it? It's like, no, because it's much closer than we perceive it. God says, I dwell in the praises of my people. It's like, I'm right there. You have the ability to bring that dimension here. God dwells in the presence of his people. There is something that connects. It's why sin separates and pushes God far away. And uh, God gives us the ability to step free from sin, to break free, to make the choices. And ultimately, one day, that's where we go. We have heaven as the ultimate outcome if we live that life. It's where Christ is today. Acts 111, men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, a place, but someday he will return from heaven the same way you saw him go. Acts 7.55. Think about this. This is a great glimpse of what I'm talking about. This is Stephen. He's, uh, he's speaking and preaching boldly. They didn't like it. Paul's holding garments at the time of this. But it's Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven as they're stoning him, saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand, place, looked into heaven, a place, not just stars, he's seeing a place that's another dimension, yet heaven opens to him, and he gets a glimpse, uh, and he sees Jesus standing in a place of honor at God's right hand, and he told them, look, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. These are places, locales, positions uh, that are in heaven. It's not just like ethereal floating out there. It's a solid place. It is more real than this life. Everything we see around us is going to fade. The body you dwell in is going to fade. Who you are is going to be one of two places for eternity. With God or another place that we're not talking about today. Because this is about heaven. But it's re very revealing. A man standing upon the earth, able to see this, and able to see that dimension open, revealed. One day the heavens are all going to roll back. The sky is going to roll back. It's going to go up in flames. And then man is going to man is going to see what he hasn't been seeing, and it's going to freak him out. Where do Christians go when they die? Philippians 1:21. It was Paul wrestling with the place he found himself after persecution and beatings and whippings. You know, some people survive because they just rally themselves. And we've heard stories of people, when they lose hope, they give up and they, they, they die of lesser diseases and lesser problems simply because they've lost a reason to live. Somebody loses a loved one in a simple thing that they've dealt with all these problems for years, but they lose a loved one and they go within two weeks because they lose their reason. This is kind of the scenario that Paul's talking about when he said, uh, he said, I'm hard pressed between two, whether to die and be with Jesus or to stay, which is better for you. In other words, he's saying, I would rather go, but he continues to rally himself for our sake and for the people that he was with. Uh, he said, to, to, I having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. I've always wondered about that until this. And it's, he had the ability, if he didn't rally himself, it was over. But he rallied himself after being stoned and left for dead, after being whipped multiple times, 39 latches plus, over and over again, he rallied himself for us. But he'd rather be in another place. I'd rather depart and be with Christ. Where? In that place. That's where Christians go when they die. It's the Father's house, our text. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. A city designed and built by God. We know this from way back. This is what Abraham was seeking. The reason I'm saying this, think about this. He, Abraham was seeking something, a, a city. Uh, he waited for a city, it says in Hebrews 11, which had foundations whose builder and maker was God. A city. 
He didn't inherit everything and, and it said he didn't inherit all the promises. Waiting for us to bring that to fullness, the Bible talks about in Hebrews 11. But he didn't see it, but there was something beyond that he was looking for. You and I, as we live the life of faith, just like the one who is the father of the faith, we're looking for a place the same. That has to be something inside uh, or the motivation is day-to-day -day betterment. The reason I pray is for no problems. The reason I pray is for things to go better. The reason I do things is just right here and now. Why do we labor like we labor? Because we're living for the king. One day we're going to be in that place. It's what Abraham was focused on and saw far off. A better country. It's spoken of. Hebrews eleven sixteen. But now they desire what? A better, a better, that is a heavenly country. So not just a throne room. Not just the place where Jesus and God are, not just to the angels circling around, not just a temple, but now you're talking about a country, not just a city, but a country, land, space, people. And I imagine all sorts of beauty. God created all in nature, only it won't be diseased and full of poison ivy and everything else. But this is what we seek, and what does God say? You're seeking a place where a person is, and God says, therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared, what, a city for them. That echoes for you and I. That's true for you and I. God's making a place for you. You're living for Jesus. Salvation is about one day going to that place. One day that being your home. I want to close very quickly and just consider, it's a simple story, Dr. David Leniger uh, used to make the illustration, but what, what do we think of? What are we going to take? Well, I love the things of this life, but he's talking about a story of a rich man who on his deathbed negotiated with God to allow him to bring uh, some of his most valuable earthly treasures when he came to heaven. God's reaction was uh, at this unusual request was shocking since this man had been an exceptional, faithful, and uh, 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 fruitful man he gave him permission and granted that he bring along just one suitcase the time arrived the man presented himself at the search at the pearly gates with suitcase in hand actually both hands uh, because it was stuffed with many of the gold bars and gold bullion that would fit into it he got met at the gate by peter and said sorry uh, you know the rules you can't take that in and the man protested god said i could only one suitcase. Peter checked, found out that that was actually the exception. So he prepared to let the man in. He said, but I do have to check the contents first. And when he looked in the suitcase, he opened it and saw the gold bars and looked up at the man, looked back down the suitcase, looked at the man, squinted and said, why did you bring pavement? <laughs> you know, think about it. We have nothing that compares. Everything the least of the least that we can compare to of that place is our most valuable in this life. We are being prepared for something. John writes about streets of gold, uh, and uh, this is the vision that he saw. And no doubt uh, it is, there is truth in this, but I believe there is more of a reality than just what we think of as gold. God's talking about something that is God's talking about something that's far beyond the city itself with gates made of an individual pearl. You know what a pearl is? You ever pondered this? God said each gate is made of a pearl. Pearls are created because of problems. A clam gets one grain of sand in it. It irritates the heck out of it. And you get a pearl. God has gates made of pearl. <laughs> one pearl. What did he deal with? Did he... <laughs> Walls of jasper, streets of gold. Think about this. In that city where you're going, no more tears, no more sorrow, no more stories like some of the ones that we heard, but total healing, total wholeness. No more of the struggles with sin, no more regret, no more remorse. I've had regrets as a Christian. They, oh, I wish I did that, wish I didn't do that, made that decision. Some worse than others, but uh, bitterness gone forever. Failure left behind. That's what this place is. It's a place with God and being in there. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Well done, good and faithful servant. When you hear those words, the Bible talks, uh, one scripture talks about they will leap like, like 
uh, little calves leaping around and jumping around. That's how you're going to see me. I am going to stink and be leaping around. It's like, man, that's the like most excited I've ever seen him. No more eyeglasses, no more braces, no more wheelchairs, no more false teeth, no more bald heads, no more hearing aids, no more hospitals, nursing home, paramedics, no more CPR, no more aspirin, cancer, heart attacks. In heaven, no one grows old or feeble. That's the place that you're going. You know, we celebrated, we celebrated what Jesus did for us last week. We celebrated all that he did, his life, the cross, his death, his blood, the resurrection, how he overcame. This is what he purchased for you. Your ability to make heaven your home, your ability to be here, your ability to live the life without the shackles of sin holding you back. And when you do sin, someone you can go to at this altar and be able to get freedom, be able to find healing, be able to have help and hope in the midst of the struggles. Jesus mentioned heaven 19 times. He reverenced heaven as a dwelling place of God. He proclaimed that God reigns in heavens, in the heavens. But he declared lastly that heaven is a place of joy, rewards, and treasure. Matthew 5, 12. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Not this big wispy place, but a place, a city, a country, a place where God is, a place where Jesus is, a place where other saints that have gone before us walk and dwell and laugh and don't grow old and no more sorrow, a place that's being prepared. Matthew 6, 19, do not lay up for yourself treasures in earth where moth and rust destroy, thieves break in and steal, dogs chew up, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, thieves don't break in and steal, treasure in heaven, your giving, your generosity, your liberality, not just your faithfulness with God's tithe, that's a start, but what you do beyond that begins to build an extra treasure, just like I barely get anything when I just put stuff in the bank, 1% interest. You got two cents this month. You got $5 this month. But you put it in something as an investment. You take a chunk. You set it aside. That's what you do when you give offerings. And you give to the things of the kingdom. And God's saying, your reward is in heaven. Your reward is banked. Your reward is there. Your card, your gold card, who knows, your emerald card is there. Luke 6, 23, rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven. Talking about pressing through the struggles. One final word and then I'm done. Why should you be allowed into heaven? Why should God let you in? Asked President Reagan that once, and he paused and thought and just simply said, John 3, 16, it's what Jesus has done. But why should God let us in? Why should he let you in? Why should you have access to this place of beauty, of no tears, no sorrow? It's not simply because I don't want to go to hell. That's not good enough. There's something that has to be intentional. If you were to die today, do you know for certain you would go to heaven? You know, picture the scene. You're standing at the gates, more beautiful than you ever dreamed. You're seeing this in a sense from afar. God says certain things if you live a sinful lifestyle, and he names a bunch. He said, you won't even see heaven. They won't even let you on the road that leads to heaven. You'll see the glow from afar off, but you won't see it. But before you enter, the Lord himself approaches and asks, what possible reason can you claim for admission? What's the reason? You know, it's, I think so. <laughs> Are you worthy of I think so. I hope so. That's what I told the guy who witnessed to me. I, where would you go if you died? Uh, uh, heaven. Do you know that? Uh, I think so. I hope. <laughs> That's not good enough. It's intentional right now that you make the decision. It's right now that you have breath that you're breathing when you might not understand everything, it's that's when you and I make the decisions. When you face difficulties, you say, I'm not backing down. Persistence 
in the things of God, tenacity in the things of God, loving one another, forgiving one another and others. And it's like, you know what? I refuse to allow anything. At one time, I refused to let addictions and drugs and people in my life. I refuse to let you take me to hell. Now it's more like things. I refuse this attitude. I refuse this to come out of my mouth. I refuse this way of thinking. I'm not going to hell for any situation. Political, national, upheaval, this, that. I'm not going to hell because I carried some attitude or got bitter over something. It's like, you know what? I'm putting that at the cross. I can pray about it. Can't do much else about it. God's in control. No one goes to heaven by accident, but heaven is being prepared intentionally, a place for those that make the decision, I'm going to live according to what God's put in place. I am going to focus on this. There is a place being prepared for you right now. And if there's any struggle, we're going to open up the altar in a second. If there's any struggle, you have a place that you can bring the problems, the sins, and repent or turn or call to Jesus. Amen. Let's bow our heads this morning. Heads bowed, eyes closed. What a wonderful place. We have such a limited grasp of how beautiful, but a place where love permeates, where love absolutely radiates through and through. There's no sun, no moon. It speaks of, a, of the city coming down from heaven, the new Jerusalem, and the dynamics of that, just what's represented there. Talks about the river of life that flows and brings healing from the throne. How beautiful. How unimaginably beautiful. And God even talks about the fact this world and the heavens are going up in flames. God's doing away with it. He said, I'm making new heaven and new earth. A place that sin hasn't tarnished, sin hasn't ravaged lives that haven't been haven't been absolutely assaulted tempted by this morning you're here and i want to ask the question do you know jesus christ for yourself personally not do you know about him not have you heard stories about him do you know jesus for yourself and saying it's a personal thing is not, that's not the answer. It is very personal, but it is very much a reality. Pastor Greg touched on it this morning in Sunday school. He talked about the fact that there is a point in time when you have an encounter with God, you can name it. And if you can't give the day, you definitely know around the time. It was somewhere in the summer of blank. I was going through it. I asked God for help, things began to change. I don't know when it all sunk in, but I am not the same person. I called out to Jesus, he changed my life. I turned, I cut ties with everything that was sin. I cut ties with the bar scene, or I cut ties with things I was doing. I stopped living like I was living. None of us deserve salvation. Not the pastor that's doing the altar call tonight or this morning to any of us we don't deserve salvation jesus purchased it with his blood offers it as a gift but he calls something the first words recorded of jesus was not i love you was not to come to me it was repent it wasn't even believe first he said repent and then believe you have to be willing to turn from the things that are sin. Some of our sin is simply rejecting what God says. Well, I don't believe that because a man's saying it or a person is saying it. That's sometimes the, the response. I don't believe in the church. Well, Jesus raised up the church. He calls it his bride. And not every church is doing what he asked, but many, many, many are. Within that setting though, he said, I chose the foolishness of preaching. That's what God chose. But to you this morning, he extends the offer of salvation. If you will be willing to repent and believe that God loves you, died for you, shed his blood for you, that blood blots out the stain of your sins. That blood is what makes you right. You can make an exchange. Lord, I surrender. You can exchange your life of sin, which is put upon him on the cross. And what God does is exchanges his righteousness onto your life that was purchased and paid for. You can have that. 
If you're in that place, you have need of that. What I want you to do this morning is lift your hand up and set it back down. Pastor, I'm not right. There's sin in my life. And I want to make a decision this morning. I am repenting. Unsaved, maybe backslidden. God sees that hand. Anyone else? God's here to minister this morning. See, heaven is a real place. Hell is a real place. We can have a lot of things we don't understand about living for God. I understood nothing. I understood nothing. My pastor preached stuff and I began to do it simply out of hope that maybe they knew something I didn't. And the more I made those decisions, the better my life got, things changed, miracles did happen. And God touched my life again and again, made himself real, what no man could do. Again and again. God doesn't always ask us to understand things, but to understand that what he's saying is the way it is. Man has all his opinions. Sometimes we have all our opinions this morning. He's extending an opportunity. We, his will is that none would perish, that none would go to hell. It wasn't made for man. But that means you have to make a decision this morning. Anyone else unsaved, backslidden, and you want to respond, God's tapping your heart. All right, in the back, you raised your hand. You raised your hand in the back to respond to that. Did you mean that this morning? Hallelujah. Someone's going to pray with you. Hallelujah. For the saints, I'm simply going to open up the altar and there's a place God's prepared for you. If there's a need to just refresh it, oh God, thank you. I know you're leading me there. You're helping me. You've made it this far. He can get you the rest of the way. And if there's something that is sin in your life, leave it at the altar. Amen. Let's stand this morning. The altar's open. If you raised your hands, you come. Someone's going to pray with you. Jesus, mother of my soul.
for you. You're not doing everything you do just because it's rules. You're not doing everything you do just because, uh, uh, you know, it's, this is what the church says to do. You're doing it because God is leading you along a way. It's not the way you came. It's not how you got here. Think of what God, what sin did for you. And God's doing everything he can to get all of that out of us. As I said at the beginning, I still struggle. I've been saved since 87, and I'll be in prayer, and my head will still revert back. Uh, it's distant, it's far away, it's this, it's that. You have to pull that down. That's never going to go away till I put off this corruptible and put on incorruption, till I make heaven my home. That's the battle. That's part of it. That's one thing. That's the flesh. That's the natural man. That's the carnal man if you give place to it, which is really bad. But then there's the enemy that assaults, that knows what you deal with and throws fiery darts just to ins to incinerate areas of your mind, get them lit up in flames. Why do we do what we do? Why do we pray? Because we need it. Not because God's trying to make it harder. He's like, no, you need it. You need what I do through prayer and in prayer. You don't have to see it. You don't have to understand it. Just know you need it. Why do I read? Why do I have to come to church? Because church is a supernatural atmosphere that God dwells in and God will speak to you that is like no other. We watch conference videos there's a unique dimension because we're gathered in a church setting, but sitting at home watching a conference video is not the same as being at a conference by any means. It is not even close. You get a message, you can be a little encouraged. It is not even the same thing because there's a supernatural dimension. And so God's making a, a way. He is the way, the truth, the life. He's preparing a place for you. And so we go in this confidence. Amen. We're going to dismiss this morning. Uh, Shane closes in prayer. Oh, dear God, we thank you, Lord God, to speak to us this morning, God, to bless us, God, with understanding your heaven that you have prepared for us. God, help us, God, to be dwelling us often, daily, Father God, and to get closer to you in prayer, knowing that you are the light near us. So, God, we pray your blessing upon us, God, in uh, the fellowship in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you. See you standing.